Well, there you go. Some of the argument he said he got to a point in time that the lawmakers had to caution themselves because they were visibly frustrated because everyone is looking for solution, isn't it? The killings and the attacks uh, weren't too many, and we're looking for ways by which these things can stop. And so tonight, let's get a sense of uh, what exactly is happening around that corridor. And tonight, I'm being joined by Honorable Yakubu Umar Bade, uh, the member representing Shikun. Kajuru, federal constituency of Kaduna said in the House of Representatives, was a former member of the House Committee on Land Transportation. He joins us live from Kaduna said. Thank you so much, honorable member, for joining us tonight. Um, the saddest incident that happened on that rail track happened in your constituency, and it does look like things have gotten to a head, isn't it? And, um, well, we heard the governor saying there needs to be bombed. These bandits, these terrorists need to be cleared out. Give us a sense of what is happening locally. You are closer to your people. Uh, thank you, Sharon, for uh, inviting me. And to say the least, I will tell you I'm very sad. What has happened is very unfortunate, and my condolence goes to the families that lost their loved ones, and to those that are still kidnapped, I pray that they will come back quickly. Um, Shemu, the truth is this. I have said it severally. Today we are talking about the bombing of the train. You agree with me that it is the elite now that follows the train in Nigeria. Because the cost of the train from Abuja to Kaduna is three, it ranges from 3,005 to 5,005. And if you go by road, the cost of to Kaduna is just five. So you can see that the poor man still goes by the connection seems to be horrible there but part of the conversation and some of what we're hearing uh, although there hasn't been any difference in terms of uh, the data that has been released by uh, the state government or the federal government as far as those who uh, were abducted uh, are concerned. But let's take a look at that um, data that was released and the information released by the state government yesterday telling us that about eight people were, have been killed and uh, to over 20 or so of them uh, injured and uh, um, unspecified numbers are now unaccounted for perhaps abducted in the hands of uh, some of these uh, terrorists, hoping that we'll get them as far as, the, as the, the military and the security agencies can. But part of the frustration is also uh, what led to these, and part of our conversation also tonight will be how we can keep uh, the rail track safe. Uh, the Honorable Member is uh, had experience on uh, oversighting on uh, the issue of uh, land transport, which include, of course, rail tracks. So you can see there, 26 people injured. As far as the information that we're getting is concerned, eight bodies recovered, and uh, 362 people, we understand, have their tickets validated. Uh, we do not know how many of them, out of the 398 passengers who bought a ticket, got on the, uh, the train, but 362 are their uh, tickets validated. Honorable Bade, um, if you can hear me now, uh, we had uh, your connection go, uh, gone awry, but give us a sense of what you think is, go I mean, is happening locally. Do your people know those people who are attacking? Yes, thank you, Sean. Uh, I hope you can hear me now. Of course, uh, I will say they know they have been passing, but I'm sure they do see them passing through their their villages, and unfortunately, there is nothing they can do because even if they call the security, most of times before help could come, these people who are motorbikes will have run into the interland, 
and you know the area is not motorable. The best the security can do is to also get motorcycles and pursue them. Now, what is happening is very unfortunate. I will tell you that I have uh, looked at this and I feel there is need for us as a country to look for foreign assistance. I listened to Senator Mark Ademi today on the floor of the Senate, and I agree with, totally with him. There is nothing wrong in we inviting foreign or developed nations to come and help us. Absolutely nothing is wrong with that. And remember that what happened on the rail is just a minute incident compared to the number of people that were killed in Giwa. Over 170 people were killed. Now, because they are in the villages, they are the poor ones, it wasn't given the prominence that this incidence of the rail is given. And secondly, because it's the elite that are now following the rail, you see the prominence it attracted. The vice president was in Kaduna. I expected that he should have visited the poor people in Giwa also to commiserate with them over what happened. But because they are the poor, nobody went there. And this is very unfortunate. And I have listened also to the Minister of Transport where he, he, he expressed his frustration about the integrated uh, security monitoring and surveillance system solution that was not installed. Chen, we are aware that this incident is something that even is, we don't need a soothsayer to tell you that it was an incident waiting to happen. So why were precautions not taken? Who frustrated the Minister of Transport from having a device or the technology to study the rail and monitor whatever is happening there? Who stopped that? And who frustrated his effort in getting that kind of gadget installed on our rail? You see, as long as we continue to go this way, where people are not punished for their inability to perform their function, I think we are not close to any solution in terms of insecurity in this country. It's unfortunate it has happened. Honorable, but uh, I do. Yeah. Yes. I would like our viewers to also listen to the perspective of Governor Nasir Arufai. As a number one citizen of that state and the chief security officer, he has his frustration that he has had so many times about how things should be handled. He was at a villa the other time and was speaking about the fact that these guys uh, need to, there not needs to be a simultaneous operation to, f to flush these guys out. In fact, there was a time also in Abuja at the conference where the governor was, uh, was saying that the military should go and bomb them from their enclaves or from their hiding places, although uh, there are all those people will believe that in doing that, there might be some danger, there might be collateral damage. But this uh, what the governor had to say on this particular incident, and he's not changing his position on bombing these uh, terrorists and these uh, mindless people who are killing innocent Nigerians. Take a listen to Governor Nasir Arafat. What we've always said is the way to end this banditry is simultaneous military and ground operations. If we have the Air Force <clears throat> bombing the, the camps, we know, the, we know where the camps are. We have the maps. We know everything. We have their phone numbers. We listen to their conversations uh, sometimes. So, but it has to be done across the five states and the and Niger state. At the same time, what you've been doing over the years is you go to Zamfara, you chase them out, they move to Sokoto. You go to Sokoto, you chase them out, they move to Kebi. From Kebi, they move to Katsina, Kaduna. And they move seamlessly because of the forest ranges. So what needs to be done is at the same time, Bomb the, bomb the forests, bomb the camps, and have ground troops on the ground as a blocking force, consisting of the army, the, 
the, the, the, the, the, the, the, the, the police, the Air Force Special Forces, Navy Special Forces on the ground, and just wipe them out once and for all. Of course, that has risks because some of the camps may also contain innocent people that have been kidnapped. But this is war. In war, you always have collateral damage, unfortunately. And if we continue piecemeal approach to this banditry, it will continue to grow because the amount of money these guys are making is so much that they will not stop. Now, Honorable, you heard the governor there, Nasi Arafai. This was an event I was referring to when he was at the villa at one of those engagements uh, on a Thursday, and he was expressing his opinion on how he thinks that these um, operations can be tackled. What is your view on that, on how he thinks this can be handled if he was, these guys can be bombed out of their, uh, out of their hiding places? Uh, Shem, absolutely, absolutely. That is a very, very good uh, uh, decision that should have been done. But the question here is this. Are we just realizing that that's, need, that's what needs to be done? And if that is what needs to be done, who is not taking action? Or is the military incapable of taking action on the suggestion by the governor? That is the question we should ask. Or are we saying the hierarchy of the military does not have this simple solution? Because I know the governor, he's, he's, not, a, he's not a security expert. Do our generals need a man and every fight to tell them what to do? What's preventing them from doing that? Have they run out of ideas? It's very unfortunate and sad. It's Let me ask you, Honorable, you are closer to your people, yes. so you can tell us. Some of these people, what are you hearing about them? Are they locals? Are they foreigners? Do your people know them? They may have cited them when they came for this attack. Truly, most of them are foreigners. And they are very young, between the age of 18 to 25 or to 30, thereabout. Because I've interviewed a lot of my constituents who have seen these people on their motorbikes, and they are young people. Most of them are non-Nigerian. And some of them, you see that they hide their faces. It means that there is connivance with the locals too. Now, because they are afraid of being recognized, they turn their face or they are who they are. So it's connivance. So I mean, what then you, you, is the problem? Is, I mean, if if that. Some of the locals are seeing them. And one of the, the fear of uh, the security agencies is that they're not getting as much intelligence. And intelligence is simple. Information that can be processed that will help in operations. So, I mean, uh, why is it difficult that your people, the local people, are not able to, to get information to security agencies? What is exactly is going on? Is there a disconnect? between the people who are supposed to provide intelligence to uh, the security agencies? I will tell you it's very unfortunate. We have incidences where a particular report, intelli intel uh, intelligence report is given to the military, and the next moment, the bandit has gotten that information. So until we fish out the most, even in the military, the the, the, the confidence of the locals will continue to be eroded. Most at times, anyone in the village that takes a report to the military, the next moment, the bandit or the terrorists will hear about it and they will know who, made, who took that report there and his family are dealt with or wiped out. We have incidences like that until, until we remove all the moles, even amongst the military the confidence of the locals will continue to be Let me ask again, uh, Honorable, and uh, one of the debates on the floor, when one of your colleagues uh, was suggesting that um, citizens should be allowed to carry arms to defend themselves, 
amongst the locals in your area because now these attacks are coming on your people are there mechanisms of self-defense um, in whatever way and i'm talking about organized uh, vigilante groups and some kind of um, um, security uh, agencies within the local communities that also serve as a first layer of protection to your people yes uh kudos to the state government we have the cadvis uh which is the kaduna vigilante service they've been doing a lot but if you consider the the power uh, the firepower of the bandit or the terrorist compared to the dead gun or the knives and arrows or the the swords uh, which the vigilantes hold you see it's nothing uh, nothing to compare with the terrorists that are having ak-47 with maybe rounds of bullets up to 500 or 1000 so you agree with me that the vigilante can only serve as a conduit for information dissemination otherwise they can, right. they, they we are due for a break go. honorable we are due for a break but I, I wouldn't allow you go honorable without getting to hear from you what do you think is the urgent solution because the lives of your own constituents members are involved here in 30 seconds if you can tell us what do you think can be the immediate solution because if your people are involved they must have a, a clue onto how this can be resolved isn't it 30 seconds honestly i think it's commitment from the side of the government and everyone real commitment okay Honorable Yakubu Bade, uh, member of uh, representing Shikun Kajuru, federal constituency of Kaduna State in the House of Representatives. Thank you so much, Honorable. And we commiserate with your people who have lost their lives and those who have also uh, the families of those who are expecting their family members back home. Thank you so much for joining us tonight on the program.